Welcome to Living Faith Bible Church, where our mission is developing mature believers who reflect the image of Christ. Our church is not just a building. It is a group of men, women, and children from different backgrounds and stages of life gathering together to worship our loving God, Jesus Christ. We invite you to hear the gospel that transforms lives and gives hope to a hurting world. This gospel message is all about what Jesus has done for us by his death and resurrection for our sins not what we can do for him to earn his favor. We are excited to have you join us for worship today, whether you are a longtime member or a first-time visitor. We are thrilled to have you here. Now let's stand and get ready to worship. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody here to a worship service at Living Faith Bible Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. So we serve a powerful, almighty, everlasting, limitless, all-knowing, and of course, the list goes on, Heavenly Father. Every detail of my life he knows, and nothing falls out of his control. Every circumstance in my life, whether good or bad, he directs and guides. So one of the prophetic references to Christ, we read in Isaiah, it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation.
be a mystery that all human history is seen as a time scale that counted down to when our Lord Jesus entered into this world. All prophets and those early saints and believers put their hope in that day. Then history did a 180. Now looks forward to counting down to what? No wonder. Someone's culture will say progress, a utopian society. As believers, we know what's coming. For if we counted down to seeing the day of salvation, isn't it logical for counting up to the day of our Lord, our Lord's return? Sounds logical to me. I don't know about you. So let's be strong in the Lord and, care and, and continue to carry the hope found in the gospel. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit.
Oh 
face to face and be able to say that you are forever mine. Take an opportunity now to say hello to somebody standing or seating next to you. Welcome to Living Faith Bible Church. We're so excited that you came. At this time, children are dismissed to go to Living Kids. If this is your first time, feel free to go back in the lobby to check in your child and meet today's teacher to ask any questions you may have. Speaking of first time visitors, please scan the QR code on the screen to fill out a form to let us know you came or fill out the connection tab in the bulletin. If you filled out that form or connection tab, meet us at the connection center back in the lobby after service. We'd love to give you a gift for spending part of your weekend with us. Here at Living Faith Bible Church, we believe in weekly gatherings aimed to connect with each other and grow a deeper connection to God. We have a few different options for you to get connected. Make sure to check your bulletin or check out our website for more information on these groups or other ways that you can get connected. We want to take a moment to give a big thanks to everyone who generously gives to this ministry. As a reminder, here are four ways that you can give. With your generosity and giving, we can effectively minister to the church and the local community around us. If it's your first time here, please feel no obligation to give. We're honored to have you here with us today. If you want to connect with us online, you can check out our social media, the website, and our app. We have many different ways for you to stay in touch and informed. Thanks again for coming to Living Faith today. Make sure to stop at the Connection Cafe at the end of the service to grab a cup of coffee and a treat. Now, let's get back to our service. Well, good morning again, everybody. I am uh, Ryan Walsh. I am one of the deacons here at Living Faith and Bible Church. All the information, contact information, there's a tab on the very back of all your bulletins uh, where you can find all the contact information from all the deacons uh, so we can, you know, of course, come alongside and support you. Um, and there's a lot of information, always active and exciting things are going on here at Living Faith, so we really ask you to take an opportunity to look through your bulletin, but just for the purposes of our, uh, just for today, I'm just going to go over a couple of announcements. So Men's Fellowship is coming up Thursday the 18th, so mark your calendars, please sign up today. Uh, there's more information again about that in your bulletin, among other things that are going to be coming up in the weeks of ahead, you'll see some National Day of Prayer, there's a meal on concerts, and invite a friend summer batch. So please stay tuned for that as we get closer. For our next announcement that we do have, save the date, Salt Sisters. Luncheon is coming up Saturday, April 20th at noon. Uh, please join for tea, scones, and sandwiches fellowship, and we have our very own Jennifer Sands who's gonna be speaking at that, yes, give it up for Jennifer Sands. No pressure, Jennifer, no pressure at all. <laughs> and uh, so with that being said, we'll turn it over to some prayer. And uh, we'll take an opportunity also to lift up Israel, who's unfortunately received a, uh, an increase of the, um, I guess, the war that's going on between them and Palestine. So we'll make sure we uh, keep the, all those people in our prayers, too. So, Father, we first want to thank you and praise your name, Lord. Um, there should never be a day where we don't praise you for the God that you are, a God of mercy, a God of grace, Lord. Um, we should not always think of the things that we need, Father, but just to praise you for the God that you are. You loved us, and so we love you. Father, we want to make sure that our relationships with you are right. Uh, if there's anything that is preventing true fellowship with yourself and true fellowship with other believers, Father, we want to seek that more importantly in front of you. Lay that at your feet, Father. Restore our hearts. Make us right um, so we can have right fellowship with you, Lord. We ask 
um, for these things, Father, always again, remembering gratitude on our hearts, Lord, the needs that we have, the desires that we have, Father, Lord, you're a God who provides abundantly according to your will, Lord. And now, Lord, we yield ourselves to you. We yield our hearts and minds, Lord. Uh, we align ourselves and our spirits to your spirit, Father. Um, for you're a God of grace and God of mercy and a God that knows all things, Lord. So we just lift this time up to you now. Pray your special hand upon our pastor, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning, Living Faith. We have the opportunity to um, have a special celebration today, so I'd like to ask for the family to come forward for a baby dedication. And uh, glad you can be with us. Come on forward. Welcome, welcome. You want to come right up front here so everybody can see you all? There you go. Come on right up. You can just be right here on the side of me. Hello, welcome. Come on right up. Come on right up. So if proud mama and papa would join us right next, come on and join us here. So, so we're here today to celebrate dedication of the Lord, and I wanted to read to you a passage from Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know them full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And so today we have come here today to bring Tejure Shanita Plummer to dedicate her to the Lord. Accompanying this precious child are her mother, Shanika, her father, Tejewan, and John and Sue McElroy uh, as godparents and supportive friends. We also have some additional friends with us here as well. Uh, Florence Johnson, right here. Okay, uh, right here. Sorry. Okay. And Saba Brunel. Saba Brunel. So we're glad to have you here as well. But also joining us, hopefully by live stream. Say hello to everyone on live stream. We have some family members as well from Jamaica, and so we want to recognize Karen Green, um, Dejanay Webb. Robert Parks, Beverly Green, uh, Jamelia Higgins, Kayawan um, Higgins, Nydia Clark, Kamisha Plummer, and Kamesha Plummer. So welcome to them that are joining us by live stream for this special day. And so we are here today, both local and around the world, uh, to publicly say to God, thank you, God, for Tasia Ray Shanita Plummer and to dedicate her to the Lord as her family commits themselves and this little one to the Lord's grace. And so as we uh, remember why we do this here as a church family, the Bible teaches us that children are a gift from God. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a, a reward from Him. So God in His goodness gives us our children um, as a great gift and a wonderful way for us to share in His creation and to raise and support them in a way that honors Him ultimately as the God who has given them to us. And so it's only proper and appropriate that when we receive a gift from someone, we give them thanks. And so we come today publicly to give thanks to God and dedicate this little one back to the Lord. Now, why do we do this here at Living Faith Bible Church? Well, we're following biblical examples. In 1 Samuel, we're told that Hannah presented her son Samuel to the Lord, and Hannah said, I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted me what I asked of him, so now I give him to the Lord, for his whole life will be given over to the Lord. And in Luke chapter 2, in verse 22, 
we read that Mary and Joseph brought their baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. And so in the same way, Shanika and Tajawan and their extended family bring Tajare to the Lord. They're presenting first themselves as parents and also their child before the Lord. And so I want to ask you today, by coming forward today, Shanika and Taj, do you hereby de declare your desire to dedicate yourselves as to the Lord God to be godly fathers and mothers to your loved one? Now, we also want to ask the family that's watching us by live stream, as well as the family and friends that are gathered here today, to also promise, as you're standing here symbolically beside this family, to walk with them throughout their life, to encourage them to raise their loved one in the Lord and to give them the strength of support and help and prayer as they need it. And so do you, as family gathered here, Pray to, uh, promise to pray to support Shanika and Tajawan and support these parents in their desire to raise Tajare in a way that pleases God. If so, as a family, if you accept this promise, would you say together, we do? We do. And you could almost hear it all the way from Jamaica. <laughs> and so now I also turn to our church family, which has recently welcomed this family into our fellowship. There is a promise on our part, a commitment on our part, and so I want to ask you, do you promise to pray for this family, to support them in any way you can in their desire to raise their child in a way that pleases God? If you're willing as a church family to come beside and support, would you respond by saying, we do? We do. Amen. And so this is my favorite part. I get an opportunity as the Lord allows, and as Teja Ray would love for me, hello, little one. Would you come beside me, mom and dad, right here? It is my privilege to offer a prayer of dedication. You are so beautiful. Uh, to offer a prayer of dedication and lift up Teja Ray to the Lord. And so, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, your word declares that children are a gift from the Lord, a precious gift, and that you have knit this child together in her mother's womb and that you have wonderful things planned for her. And so, Lord God, we pray your blessing upon her. We thank you for the divine love that you have showered upon her and the earthly love that you have surrounded her with, with her mother and father and her extended family. We pray your blessing upon her. We pray that you would guide her and lead her all in her life so that one day she can know Jesus Christ as her own Savior and Lord and walk with her Savior. We pray that you would strengthen her family and you would give them wisdom and strength and courage and determination to do all that they can to raise her in a godly way. We thank you for her and the gift of life. And so we ask now for the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit upon Teja Ray. We ask that the Lord God would let his face shine upon her and be gracious unto her and grant her peace. Amen. Amen. Ah, what a beautiful baby. <laughs> and she didn't even cry. She must be just angelic all the time, right? Uh, there you go. She's like, who is holding me? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this as a church family, and we're glad to be able to celebrate this day with you. Thank God bless. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of it. I bet I might still have the touch. I'm just saying that maybe one day with grandkids, you know. All right. On that note, um, let's turn to our sermon. 
So we're almost done with a sermon series uh, called Rising Above Mediocrity. It's been a study through 1 Corinthians. We're now on our 15th message. Um, just a quick reminder, 1 Corinthians is a New Testament book written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, written to help Christians in the first century in 55 AD, that Paul helped establish this church to help them overcome the areas of their life in which they were stuck, stuck in mediocrity. I think we all know what mediocrity is by now. It's when we, we aren't striving to be or accomplishing or doing what God has called us to be, to be our best, to strive. And so sometimes we get caught in patterns of, of sin or selfishness or worldliness in ways in which it, it prevents us from experiencing the best that God has for us. And so although we may struggle in various areas of mediocrity in our lives, and we've learned from God's word how to try to overcome that through the power of the gospel and through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is one ultimate mediocrity that we all face, and that's the ultimate mediocrity of death in the grave. And so on Easter Sunday, as we move through 1 Corinthians, we came to 1 Corinthians 21, which is this great passage of hope um, as we can rise above the greatest of all mediocrity, which is death and the grave. So on, first, on Easter Sunday, we looked at 1 Corinthians, and I, I shared with you the historical reality of Jesus' bodily resurrection. And I encouraged you to believe the, the truth of the gospel, the truth that is proclaimed in the Bible, that Jesus literally, physically, bodily rose from the dead, that he left the grave, and that if Jesus rose over death in the grave, then no matter what we face in this life, the ultimate death in the grave has been defeated through Jesus' victory, and we can share in that as believers. Last week, Pastor Kevin shared about the nature of our bodily resurrection as he continued to go through 1 Corinthians. He talked about how we will not have bodies that are subject to corruption and decay like we currently experience now, that we will have perfected, resurrected bodies. And today I want to talk about the timing of the bodily resurrection that's promised to us in, in the Bible and is specifically here in 1 Corinthians. And I hope to be able to communicate to you with the passage that we're going to study just as we end 1 Corinthians, that as believers, we will experience the ultimate victory over death in a bodily resurrection. And therefore, and here's the key as well, we can stand firm today as we wait for our forever tomorrow. There is a forever tomorrow coming, and we can stand firm knowing that it exists because we know Jesus Christ conquered sin and death, the greatest enemy we face. So I want to read to you the passage, and then I want to just take a moment to walk through it in the time that remains. Our passage today will focus on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll read verses 50 to the end of the chapter. Feel free to read along with me, and then we'll dive into it, and I'll have verses on the screen at that point. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed." For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that you labor in the Lord, and it's not in vain. This passage is a passage of ultimate victory. And the Bible teaches that believers, those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, 
who have repented of their sins and said, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior and I believe you've come for me, Jesus. You've died for me and you rose from the dead and I embrace you as my Savior. I believe in you. I believe in who the Bible says you are and I'm willing to let you be Lord. That believers will experience the ultimate victory over death in a bodily resurrection. Look at what, what Paul describes here in verse 50. He's describing a bodily resurrection before we enter the eternal kingdom. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Paul's describing a time in the future, not yet, when we will enter into a kingdom, an eternal kingdom, where there will no longer be anything perishable meaning our bodies that are decaying. There'll be no longer flesh and blood as we know it in this world that's subject to sickness and death. We would enter into a whole new realm, a realm that's described as imperishable and immortal. And the Bible says it's a kingdom, an eternal kingdom. We often don't think about that, or what's await, what awaits us, our forever tomorrow. But let me help you think a little bit about it. If you have a physical Bible... I want you to take the Bible in your hand. If you have a tablet or phone, that's okay, that's cool. That's how I usually read the Bible as well. You're fine. Um, you can't quite get the effect, though, this way. So if you want to grab your Bible, one thing I would say is if you have notes in your Bible, they're about ready to fall. Um, what I'd like you to do is open up your physical Bible to Genesis chapter 2, the, the connection between 2 and 3, right where the where it ends in chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, the first book of the Bible, and Genesis chapter 3. All right? Have one finger there in Genesis. Go to the back of the Bible, not the maps and the notes, but the actual book, the back, and go to Revelation 21. Put your finger there. All right, you got it? You have the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and you have the end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, right? And then do this if you want. <laughs> All right, what am I illustrating? Where are we in biblical history? We're right in the middle. We're right here, the wiggly part. What does the Bible describe? The Bible describes three errors of history. We are right now in the second. The third one is still awaiting. The third one is the one we long for. What's the first one? The first one is the story of the garden. It's the story of perfect creation with Adam and Eve, living in harmony with God. It's paradise. It's paradise. What's the second portion of this history that we're currently living in? It's called Paradise Lost. We, were, we ex were expelled from the garden through Adam and Eve's sin. We've sought it again. We only see glimmers of it. We only see foretastes of it. But it's, 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 it's just not attainable in this life. But the Bible promises that when the eternal kingdom comes, paradise will be regained and even reimagined in ways we can barely even comprehend. That's what is described in the last two chapters of the Bible in Revelation 21 and 22. Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It describes the ultimate destiny, the ultimate place of believers in a regained, reimagined, more than we can imagine, paradise. But we have to be ready bodily, physically ready to enter into that, to enter into that reality. Right now, we're in the middle. Christ has conquered sin and death on the cross. We celebrated that on Easter. He is reigning in heaven. When our loved ones in Christ depart this life, they go to be in the presence of the Lord. They're in the Lord's presence in, in, in heaven. But they're awaiting now the return to the new heaven and the new earth. They're awaiting to be resurrected bodily, to experience life eternal forever and ever, uh, uh, forever tomorrow. And that's something that all of us can place our hope and trust in. 
And you say, well, when will that happen? Paul describes it this way in verse 51. At believer's resurrection will be transformed instantly and forever. Look at what the passage says in verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. This passage is describing the moment in history when the new era starts. When we will put off our perishable bodies, our immortal bodies if we're living at that moment, and be clothed with imperishable and immortal life. Never to experience any more sin or death or the grave or even aches and pains. We will experience a whole new reality. God promises to the, that to us in Christ. Paul describes it as a mystery, meaning that it was something that was kind of hidden from the scriptures, but now made clear. But there's a sense in which it's a mystery for us today because we can't hardly imagine what it would be like in a, in a moment to be completely transformed. And yet the Bible describes that and promises that for us. It says, at the last trumpet that will happen. Now, for those of you Bible scholars that are saying, well, tell me a little bit more when this will happen and all of that and how it relates to other scriptures, I would encourage you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and you'll see a parallel between 1 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 14 to 17 where Paul describes a similar event, I believe the same event, where it says that, that according to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will be raised. Paul's describing this same moment in 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, a moment we call the rapture of being caught up to be with the Lord in the air and being with the Lord forever. And that only begins our experience of forever tomorrow as we reign and rule with Christ and ultimately as God ushers in the new heaven and the new earth. This is a transforming event that Paul is describing, that the Bible is describing. A transforming event that includes a new resurrected body. Look at what Paul says in verse 54. When... And some of you are saying, when is that going to happen? That's the big question, when. It's going to happen soon. We hope, we pray, we look forward to the day when Christ will come. But when that happens, the perishable have been, has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 8. He's saying there's a day that's coming when death itself will be defeated. The Bible describes that day when those who have already died and, and have gone to be with the Lord in spirit will be raised bodily. And there will be believers alive on the earth at that time who will not experience physical death but will be immediately transformed. This will happen in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye that Paul describes in verse 53. And Paul says in verse 54, when that happens, the victory is complete. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now why do we need a victory? Because of the sting of death and the power of the law. The Bible says that because we've sinned, We've fallen short of God's glory, and we have violated God's standard, and we're subject to God's judgment. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ entered into human history. That's why it was important and necessary for the eternal Son of God to take on human flesh and to live among us, to have a, a full humanity that He shared with us apart from sin, and to live a perfect life and to die on the cross for our sins so that He could take the sting of death for us he could have the law of God and, and, a, and, and have the judgment of the law of God applied to his account on his shoulders on the cross. But he rose from the dead to ensure our victory and to ensure that we would rise from the dead. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, 
But thanks be to God, we have the victory through Jesus Christ. That victory is available to each and every person who will humble themselves and say, Lord God, I am a sinner. And I know that I'm subject to your judgment. But I believe that your son came into this world and took my, the death I deserve in my place on the cross and that he paid the penalty for my sins and he rose from the dead and I'm putting all on Jesus. I'm putting it all on him and I'm trusting in him for my victory over sin and death. The Bible says that when we trust in Christ that way, we're assured of the victory. Now you might say, okay, so you're telling me, Alex, that when Christ comes back and catches up those who are to be with him in the air and we're instantly transformed, will I still be the same person? Well, at one level, I'd say absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. So I'd say to you guys, humbly but sincerely, for those of us all in Christ, you're stuck with Alex. I mean, there'd be a real Alex there in eternity. A real Alex, but a real Alex minus all of the things you don't like about Alex. <laughs> all of the sins and all the pettiness and all of the things that he does in, in a sinful, fleshful way will be transformed, but it will truly be us. Now, why can I say that with assurance? Because we will share in the same resurrected body as Christ. When Christ rose from the dead, he came back and his disciples recognized him. Sometimes he veiled himself for reasons unknown, but he, he showed himself openly. He showed himself. There was a continuity to his existence. He continued to be Jesus the Christ, the Son of God in human flesh, but risen in a victorious way from the grave. But there were ways in which he was different. He could show up in a room, and he, without the door opening, right? Remember the disciples were hiding and, 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 and he showed up. He didn't have to knock, he just showed up. So there's a sense in which he was different. And so I can't work this all out in my mind. It's kind of like a mystery trying to figure it out. But one, one author said, it's clear in the New Testament that there is a continuity and a discontinuity between our current bodies and our future resurrected bodies. There is a sense in which we continue and there's a sense in which we continue in a whole new way, never ever hampered by the sinful ways and the fleshly ways of our past. Imagine a brand new you. Think about it. That's your future in Christ. That's a certain future for you in Jesus Christ. And one thing is sure, the Bible says that it will be a bodily existence. Anthony Hokema says, Are we to spend eternity somewhere off in space wearing white robes, plucking harps, singing songs, and flitting from cloud to cloud while doing so? Some of us picture eternity like an angel. We're not going to be angels. We're going to be glorified human beings. We're going to be ourselves. But we're not going to be just floating on the cloud playing harp. No, the Bible says, on the contrary, the Bible assures us that God will create a new earth on which we shall live to God's praise in glorified, resurrected bodies. And on that new earth, therefore, we hope to eternity, um, enjoying its beauties, exploring its resources, and using its treasures to the glory of God. The whole new heaven and earth will be ours to enjoy, ours to be good stewards of, ours to learn from God. I believe they'll continue to be learning and experiences with God because we will still be, we will still be limited, we'll still be creatures. God alone is infinite. He alone knows everything. There's still so much that we have to learn. And I think it'll take us a whole eternity to even begin to understand the immensity of God's creation and His care and His plan and His history, I think there'll be so much to do. I hope there's actually catch and release in the river, but we'll, we'll talk about that another day. That's the only thing I'm not sure about. So, so, so I hope I painted a picture for you that is so amazing, so incredible, that you almost say, how could I not want to go? 
Well, it's very easy to go because Christ has already conquered sin and death, hasn't he? The only thing that God calls us to do is believe the gospel, to firmly stand with the gospel, to stand firm, knowing that if we wait for it, it will come, our forever tomorrow will eventually come in God's time, in God's way. So what do we need to do is we, we picture that eternal reality and our mind begins to even grasp it. Here's what we need to do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, at the beginning, at the end, it says this word, stand firm. We believe the gospel and we stand firm. Look at what Paul says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached you. Otherwise you believed in vain. How do we experience this incredible reality that God has promised for us as believers? Keep believing, keep trusting. With God's power and strength, keep holding firm. Notice what he says. This is all the benefit of the gospel. The gospel means the good news. The announcement of what Jesus has done in his coming, in his death, in his resurrection is the good news. And all we need to do is believe it. It says we receive it. We take our stand upon it. We, we say, I am trusting in Christ alone for my salvation. And I'm standing firm in that. We're saved by that reality. All we have to do is believe the gospel. That's all God asks us to do and to hold firmly to it with our faith, the Bible says if we do that, we will experience a forever tomorrow. And so Paul begins the letter by talking about this, and then notice how he ends this, this chapter. Verse 58, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Do you see a pattern at the beginning? He says, stand firm, take your stand. At the end, he says, stand firm. What do you think he wants us to do? Stand firm. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> We're getting somewhere. I'm, I'm making, making it clear. The Bible's that clear. The Bible promises us this forever tomorrow. And it says, just believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead and that you put your trust and faith in him and stand firm in that. And the Bible says, that we will experience the victory of Christ for ourselves. Now, some of you might be saying, this is like a fairy tale, Alex. It's like, you know, when we read kids' stories and they say, and they lived happily ever after. Yes, it's that true. Look at what, what uh, J.I. Packer said. He, he said, in fact, Christians inherit the destiny which fairy tales envisioned in fancy. We, yes, you and I, the silly saved sinners, live and live happily, and by God's endless mercy, we'll live happily ever after, and after, and after, a forever tomorrow, in resurrected bodies, experiencing the beauty of God's creation in full, the Bible says that's our future as believers. So let me ask you, do you include yourself as a believer in Jesus Christ, a part of this promise and this reality? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone who died on the cross, who came to this sin-cursed world and died on the cross to take the penalty that you and I deserve? He took your, your place on the cross and died for you. Are you trusting in his death and his resurrection for your forgiveness and the power to live this life here in these in-between pages right now that we find ourselves in until we either go to be with the Lord or the Lord comes back? We're to stand firm and believe. Do you believe? And as you trust in the time that we're living in right now, you can look forward to what God has for us and it can help us stand firm. Are you believing that you have the ultimate victory in Christ, the ultimate victory over the mediocrity of death and the grave, and will you stand firm in Christ? That's all the Bible says that we must do. In its most simplest form, it's that simple. 
but we need to trust and we need to stand firm. Would you pray? Father God, I pray that uh, the message I shared seems almost uh, too good to believe. Because then I will know that I even got close to expressing the absolute reality that you have planned for us who believe. It is too good to be true, but it is true. Lord, help us to trust you right now in these in-between days in our lives when we still live with the effect of the fall and the curse of sin, when in our bodies today they are decaying, when we're experiencing things in our lives like suffering and, and, and the evil around us, and we say, Lord, how long? In those days, Lord, in these days, I pray that you would help us to grasp the future that you have for us, the vision you have for us of a new heaven and a new earth brought about by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the victory that Jesus has for us. Lord, may we believe. I, I, I invite anyone here today who has never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord to humble themselves and to say, Oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I, I know it. I see it in my life. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against others. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of my sins. I ask you to give me a new heart to want to follow you and serve you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the desire to serve you and love you and to stand firm. And then give me the strength to keep standing firm. And Lord, as I stand firm and wait and long and look, I pray and I, and I know that one day you'll make that a reality in my life too. A reality of a new heaven and new earth. And so, Lord, I pray that all of us as believers would be encouraged and emboldened to believe this for ourselves and to look forward to that day with earnestness and then to stand firm and to do all that we can in the midst of this world to make it a reality for others by sharing the gospel and loving you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make that a reality in our lives as individuals and as believers. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, as we conclude our service today, this song is your opportunity to reaffirm your commitment to the Lord. Let Him be your vision and your passion. Prayers is that all things fall under the rule of God in your heart. Let's stand to conclude our service today with Be Thou My Vision.
opportunity now to spend some time with one another. Stick around for the Connection Cafe. We do have some cake in the back with a dedication. Have a blessed week, everybody.